Okay. Yeah. So the uh, space of all curves in R2 is in dimensional. So there's not just an obvious uniform measure that one can put on this space. Um, so one way to go about defining a canonical probability measure on, uh, on curves in, uh, in R2 is to uh, kind of discretize the problem. Right. So instead of looking at curves in R2, we look at curves in the, uh, in the, the square lattice. So we look at all paths in the, in the grid, which start at the origin, uh, and which, uh, which kind of go for n steps, staying along the, uh, the grid lines. Right. Uh, we allow uh, any possible paths here, so they're allowed to uh, kind of cross themselves at the same, uh, at the same vertex or edge more than once, uh, and, uh, and whatnot. And so there's going to be uh, only a finitely many, only finitely many possible paths in the grid uh, for any uh, any number n. Uh, and so we can just pick one of these n-step paths in the grid uh, uniformly at random. So in such a way that each possible path is assigned equal probability. Okay. And the object that we get in this when we uh, so this uh, this random path in the grid that we get in this way uh, is just called the uh, the random walk. Uh, so we have our random walk. We can view it as a continuous curve in R2 just by extending it by linear interpolation. So it traverses each edge uh, at unit speed. Uh, and then we can ask whether these continuous curves in R2 that we get from, uh, from paths in the grid uh, have, some, 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 have uh, some sort of limit as the number of steps goes to infinity. All right, and uh, I guess probably a lot of you already know that they do. Uh, namely, if we rescale space by n to the minus one half, and we rescale time by n, then these random paths, uh, these random walk paths will converge in distribution respect to the uh, uniform topology, we're limiting random path called Brownian motion. Uh, and Brownian motion uh, is the kind of the, the limit of uh, the canonical model of random paths in the grid. Uh, can, therefore, can therefore be thought of as sort of the canonical model of random paths in, uh, in R2. Uh, and here on the left, I've shown a, uh, a computer simulation of a Brownian motion with the colors indicating the time at which the, uh, the different points are there. Right, so as you can see from the simulation, Brownian motion is very far from being a smooth curve. Uh, in fact, it has uh, infinitely many self-intersections in every uh, non-trivial interval of time, uh, and it's nowhere different. So it has kind of a, an interesting uh, fractal-type geometry to it. Uh, moreover, uh, it uh, kind of has this uh, property that we call universality, which says that you can get Brownian motion as a limit, not just of random walk, not just of these random paths on the grid, but Brownian motion also arises at the limit of various other types of interesting uh, discrete random paths. Okay, so it really is a kind of a canonical object. It doesn't really depend on the particular choice of, uh, of discretization procedure that we use here. Uh, moreover, uh, Brownian motion is a very well understood mathematical object. It has lots of, uh, lots of connections to, uh, to other interesting things in math, connections to, to various real world things. Uh, and there's lots of things that you can prove about. Okay. We have a kind of a very rich, very well developed theory of a kind of a canonical model of random paths. All right? Uh, in this talk, I want to ask the uh, talk about the, the analog of this question when we go one dimension high. So instead of looking at random paths, we want to look at uh, random surfaces. We can ask whether there's some kind of canonical model of, uh, of random surfaces, i.e., uh, two dimensional uh, Ramanian manifolds. All right? Uh, we want it to be canonical, sort of in the same sense that Brownian motion. In that if we want to describe kind of the uh, the large scale behavior of various types of uh, of discrete random surfaces, okay. uh, and it turns out that the answer to this question is provided by uh, the theory of Louisville quantum gravity, um, which will be the uh, topic of today's talk. Louisville quantum gravity is a theory which originated in the physics literature uh, in the nineteen eighties, uh, where these kind of random surfaces were studied uh, in a non rigorous manner, uh, and it's been uh, kind of a very active topic of research in uh, in math. In the last uh, 15 years or so. Okay. So, um, you know, just like uh, just like the theory of Brownian motion, this theory of Louisville quantum gravity has connections to uh, the various uh, various topics in uh, in math and physics, uh, some of which I've listed here. Um, and uh, you know, and it's you know still kind of a, and it's at least expected to be a sort of universal object. Uh, to describe the scaling limit for the, the large scale behavior of lots of interesting uh, discrete, uh, discrete random objects. All right, so let me now, so the kind of the, the goal of the talk will be to explain to you the definition of Louisville quantum gravity, uh, the motivations for studying it, uh, and some of, uh, some of what's known and what's not known about this, uh, about this theory of random surfaces. Uh, 
So let me begin by uh, kind of clarifying this question a little bit. Uh, so I asked, what is the canonic, what is, you know, is there a canonical model of, uh, of random surfaces? Um, and when we talk about random surfaces, there are kind of different uh, different things that we could mean. Uh, so we could ask, uh, you know, when we're choosing our random surface, are we randomizing just over the, the geometry of the surface, or are we randomizing also over the topology? So are we going to have surfaces that have a random topological structure, or is just the just the geometric structure going to be random? Uh, so both questions seem a priori to be interesting, uh, but the focus of this talk is going to be the case where just the just the geometry of the surface is random. We fix an underlying uh, topological surface, and we ask to, uh, to choose kind of a random two-dimensional Ramanian manifold with that given uh, topology. Uh, we can do this for any kind of uh, random underlying uh, topology that we wanted to. Uh, for simplicity, I'm going to focus just on the case of, uh, of random surfaces homeomorphic. Okay. It's also possible to define random surfaces homeomorphic to the disk or the torus or the whole plane or what have you uh, via similar procedures. Uh, but just uh, just to keep things things simple, I'm just gonna uh, just gonna talk about this here. Um, now there are many different uh, different approaches to defining random surfaces homeomorphic to the sphere, or equivalently to choosing a random Ramanian metric surface. Uh, um, there uh, and you know so sort of many of these approaches approaches are either uh, either expected or have been proven to be uh, equivalent to one another. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to discuss uh, kind of three of these different approaches. So, kind of three different ways that one might uh, go about trying to endow the sphere with kind of a canonical notion of a random uh, Ramanian metric. All right. Uh, and each of these different approaches have, uh, have various advantages and disadvantages, and maybe reveal some uh, some different uh, different parts of the, different, kind of different aspects of this problem. All right. So, uh, let me begin. Uh, by discussing an approach which is kind of inspired by the idea of constructing Brownian motion uh, by looking at uh, looking at random data. Okay? We want to define some sort of notion of discrete random surfaces uh, and then try to take a limit of these discrete random surfaces as the, uh, the number of kind of bits of random input goes to infinity uh, and ask whether, and then, you know, if we, see, if we could, could succeed in doing that, then we would have uh, something that we could try to kind of think of as a canonical model of uh, continuous random. All right, so, um, so to, uh, to kind of carry out this approach, I first need to explain to you a model of uh, discrete random surfaces. Okay, so one, uh, one natural way of choosing uh, some notion of a discrete surface uh, is to look at uh, triangulations of the sphere. Okay, so for completeness, uh, I've put a definition here. A triangulation of the sphere is a graph, i.e. a collection of vertices and edges. Uh, which has been drawn in the sphere in such a way that no two edges cross. Um, huge modulo orientation preserving homeomorphisms from the sphere to itself, uh, subject to the condition that all of the, uh, uh, the faces, i.e. the regions enclosed by the edges, are triangles, meaning that, that each of these faces is exactly three, uh, three edges. All right, so uh, that's, a, that's, that's a possible definition of a triangulation of the sphere. Um, and we can kind of think of, the tri of a triangulation of the sphere as being a discrete surface with the topology of the sphere uh, in the following manner. So uh, we can think of each of these faces as being endowed with the, uh, the structure of a, uh, a surface, which is isometric to an equilateral triangle with unit sign. Right? So in other words, each face uh, can be thought of as a, uh, each face kind of has the, the Ramanian, Ramanian metric structure of an equilateral triangle with unit sign. Okay, and then we can imagine that these spaces are identified along the edges in order to produce a surface which, uh, which has the topology of the sphere, uh, and whose metric is flat on each face and has kind of conical singularity at the, uh, the vertices of the triangle. But uh, one way to kind of visualize this procedure is that we can imagine uh, the triangles that are used to produce the triangulation as being made out of maybe some kind of fabric. So you have a collection of uh, equilateral triangles made out of fabric, and then you can imagine that you sort of stitch these triangles together along their boundaries uh, to produce a uh, surface uh, subject to the constraint the surface that you get is, uh, is homeomorphic. And then that gives you a, uh, a, uh, a kind of a notion of, of a discrete surface with the, uh, the same topology. Uh, so we're interested here in this talk in, uh, in random surfaces. Uh, so we want to choose one of these triangulations of the sphere uh, randomly. Uh, the simplest way to do that is, uh, is uniform. 
let's say we pick some number n. Uh, since we're viewing these things modulo homeomorphisms, there's only n possible triangulations of the sphere. Uh, and hence, we can choose one uniformly at random. So, uh, in such a way that each of the possible triangulations is assigned uh, equal probability. Uh, this is kind of the, the simplest model of random triangulations that we could consider. Uh, it's also of interest sometimes to consider uh, kind of uh, non uniform models of random triangulations, where some possible triangulations are more likely to be seen than, uh, than others. And of course, there are lots of different ways that we might uh, that we might think of to kind of bias our random triangulations. Uh, but it turns out that one, uh, one particularly uh, particularly natural non-uniform measure on uh, on triangulations to consider uh, is the following. So a uh, a triangulation is a graph, all right. Um, you know, has vertices and edges, uh, and so there's a notion of the uh, discrete Laplace operator of the graph. So like the, the graph Laplace. I, uh, you don't need to know the precise definition of this operator, um, but uh, really all you need to know is that it's a linear operator from the space of, uh, of functions on the graph, uh, functions in the vertices of the graph to itself. So it's a linear operator between two finite dimensional vector spaces um, of, the, of the same dimension, uh, and therefore it has a, uh, a determinant. Okay. Uh, and this determinant of the, uh, the discrete Laplace operator could be different for different triangulations. Okay. Um, and so if we look at a, uh, a random triangulation uh, with n triangles sampled with probability proportional to the determinant of the discrete Laplacian uh, operator to some power, then we will obtain a, uh, a non-uniform measure on triangulations. We get a random triangulation where some of the possible triangulations are more likely than, uh, than others. Okay. And for historical reasons, this power uh, that we put on the, uh, the, uh, the discrete Laplacian determinant is going to be denoted by the negative C over two. And we think of C as being like the, the parameter for this one parameter family of models of, uh, of random triangulations. All right. And the parameter goes between zero and infinity or between uh, minus infinity? Minus infinity. And infinity. Uh, actually, I'm always going to require it to be less than 25 um, because it's expected to be degenerate if C is bigger than 25. But um, I'll, 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 get, I'll get to that later. Okay. But uh, for, for the time being, we can think that we have a, a pra one parameter family of models of random triangulations that are parameterized by just a set of all, uh, all possible real, real values of this, uh, this number. All right. Um, and uh, of course, there are also lots of other different similar types of models that we could consider. Instead of looking at triangulations, we could look at quadrangulations where we you know, stitch together squares instead of triangles. Uh, or we could look at uh, things where we have mixed face degree. Maybe we have some, uh, some faces of degree three, some faces of degree four, some faces of degree five. Etc. And we can also look at like other possible weightings besides this uh, uh, this, this determinant of Laplacian to a uh, to a power. Right. So here, so if C is getting big, what you're trying to do will be weighting more things that have that like pinch into pieces. Uh, yeah. So so one way of thinking about it is that if C is bigger, you're making things tend to be more tree-like, and if C is smaller, you're tend you're making things tend to be more Randish. Uh, more more like uh, more like just like kind of a regular uh, regular lattice. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so you know it's expected that these kind of modifications where we allow you know different different phase degrees and such shouldn't affect the large scale behavior of these things. Uh, and this is uh, kind of a conjectural form of universality, similar to this idea of universality for uh, for different kind of things that converge to Brownian All right. So we have these uh, these kind of models of random uh, random triangulations, or models of other sorts of, of other kinds of random pointer maps, if you prefer. Uh, and we want to ask, uh, you know, do they converge in some sense as the number of triangles goes to infinity? So do we have something analogous to the uh, convergence of random walk to Brownian motion, uh, where instead of looking at uh, random paths, we're looking at these random uh, random surfaces? Uh, now there are various different topologies that we. Can Consider uh, convergence in here, um, and uh, kind of for completeness, uh, I'm going to now specify a, a particular mode of convergence that we're going to be looking at uh, throughout the throughout this talk. Okay, right, so we can view our triangulation as a uh, a metric measure space, i.e., right? a topological space equipped with a metric uh, and a measure. Um, the uh, the metric uh, is just the the counting measure on vertices. So the measure that assigns each vertex of the triangulation uh, mass uh, mass one, uh, and then the measure uh, is just the, sorry the metric is the the graph distance. So the distance between any two vertices 
it's the minimum length of area of half an edge is joined away from first. Okay. We've endowed our triangulations with a Romanian, uh, Romanian uh, metric structure. We could also, instead of looking at the, uh, the counting measure on vertices and the graph distance, we could look at like the Romanian volume form and the associated Romanian distance function. Uh, but it's expected that those should have kind of similar, uh, similar macroscopic behavior. All right, so uh, we may as well look at just kind of this, uh, this easier to define uh, metric and measure structure on our, uh, on our triangulation. And, and so uh, triangulation in this way can be viewed as a, uh, or a compact metric measure space. Uh, and then we can ask whether random triangulations converge uh, with respect to the uh, sort of natural topology on uh, the space of all compact metric measure spaces. Uh, which is called the Romov Hausdorff Komarov topology. All right, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to give a precise definition of this topology. Uh, all you really need to know is that it's kind of the most natural topology that you can put on the space of all compact metric measure spaces, and it satisfies the sort of nice properties that you want a topology to satisfy. So it's complete and uh, separable and metrizable, uh, and all of those nice kinds of things. Uh, uh, yeah, so for those of you who have heard uh, previously of the Gromov Hausdorff topology, uh, this Gromov Hausdorff Prokhorov topology is just sort of the, uh, the obvious generalization of Gromov Hausdorff in the case when you also have a, uh, a measure of your space in addition to, uh, to just a metric. Okay. So uh, we can then ask you know, do our, do our random triangulations converge in distribution with respect to this Gromov Hausdorff topology? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. Uh, in the case when the, uh, the value of C is zero. So equivalently in the case where we're looking at a uh, uniform part. Right, so this is a, uh, a very hard result, uh, but it has been, uh, has been proven uh, and works by Legal and Miermont uh, circa, circa 2011. Okay. Um, so the limiting object that I get uh, is a random metric measure space called the, uh, the Brownian map. Um, and this, uh, this random metric measure space is almost surely homomorphic to the sphere but the geometric structure is very different from the geometric structure of the sphere. Uh, for example, uh, the Hausdorff dimension of this metric space is four. So if you're in the Brownian map, it takes about epsilon to the negative four balls of radius epsilon uh, with respect to the Brownian map metric to cover the whole space. All right, so this is a space which is kind of topologically two-dimensional, uh, but uh, kind of metrically uh, four-dimensional. I'll uh, give you a, a little bit of a sense as to what this looks like. Uh, show this, this picture on the top left, which is a computer simulation of a large random triangulation, uh, which has been drawn in, uh, in three dimensional space in such a way that the lengths of the edges are as close as possible to one. All right, and so that means that the, uh, the, the graph distance between two vertices of this, uh, this large random triangulation is going to be approximately the uh, kind of the shortest length of a path on the surface of this, uh, this spiky looking object uh, going between the two. All right, um, so as you can see, it's, it's very fractal, has a lot of these spikes coming off of it. It uh, doesn't look at all sphere-like, uh, but perhaps surprisingly, in the limit, this random metric space uh, still converges to something with the topology of the sphere. It uh, just, uh, just has a very, uh, very fractal, uh, uh, fractal random geometry uh, on, the, uh, on the sphere. Okay, in particular, uh, this, uh, this limiting object is not actually a literal Romanian manifold. Uh, it's just a random metric measure space. Uh, and it cannot be endowed with the structure of a smooth Romanian manifold because, uh, you know, for example, because it has Hausdorff mentioned strictly larger than G, right? So it's not, uh, not at all a smooth object. Um, rather, it's just a, uh, kind of a metric and a measure uh, on a space homeomorphic to the square. Yes? Is, is this thing, so in Brownian motion, of course, you know, it's a parametrized object. And yes. here you're saying that the thing ends up having a parameterization by the two sphere. Yes. But is there like a natural biholder homeomorphism? Yes, or... uh, indeed there is. And I will explain that later in the talk. Okay. There's, a, there's an alternative way of constructing this where it does come with a, uh, a kind of a canonical kind of, kind of, kind of parameterization by the two sphere. Uh, it is, is, is indeed biholder. Okay. Is it normalized at this point? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, you do have to normalize the distance, of course, because. Uh, you know, the graph distance between two things is going to be going to infinity as n goes to infinity. And so uh, you normalize by a factor of n to negative one four. So the, the areas get, get, get scaled, of course, by one over n, and the distances get scaled by one over n to the one four. Okay, this, this one fourth is related to the factor of the vector. Okay, so uh, the next thing that we're going to 
Um, and then there's also kind of some improved convergence results on this uh, that come from works by Miller, Sheffield, and Holden and Sun, uh, where you can actually show that if you kind of take your random triangulations, if you embed them in the sphere in a certain canonical way, then they converge to this Brownian map uh, embedded in the sphere in a canonical way. So this is related to Schmuel's question that you actually can show like convergence of triangulations viewed as parameterized surfaces to the Brownian map viewed as a parameterized surface. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll say more about that uh, a little bit later. But, um, so we have this, uh, this convergence only in, the, only in the case of uniform triangulations. Uh, but it turns out that we can still rigorously construct uh, the trajectory limiting object of these random triangulations for all values of this, this parameter C between negative infinity and point five. So we have a one parameter family of models of sort of these random fractal surfaces, um, which have, uh, have kind of interesting properties and interesting connections to uh, to other things. All right, uh, and that's going to be uh, the topic of uh, the, uh, the last segment of the talk. Uh, first, I want to say a little bit about kind of uh, where these, uh, these global topographic surfaces, so these, uh, these random surfaces that are expected to rise as the limits of these random triangulations, uh, kind of come up in the uh, All right. So, uh, right. so the, the limits of these random triangulations are conjecturally described by a uh, one parameter family of random fractal surfaces called, uh, called Louisville quantum gravity surfaces. Uh, these surfaces were first introduced in the physics literature. Uh, and because the you know, people studying them originally were physicists, they didn't really worry about questions of convergence or questions of whether things are well defined or what have you. Uh, so the definition that they were working with was roughly speaking something like the following. So the Louisville quantum gravity surface, the topology of the sphere, uh, the given parameter C, which they call the, uh, the matter central part of the model, uh, is the random surface, uh, which is given by the sphere, uh, equipped with a certain random Ramanian metric tensor. And this random Ramanian metric tensor is sampled from the quote-unquote uniform measure on Ramanian metric tensors of the sphere, weighted by the, the determinant of the Laplace Beltrami operator to the power of negative C over two. Right. So this is of course uh, very far from being uh, actually well-defined because uh, you're talking, it talks about a uniform measure on an infinite dimensional space. And it talks about the determinant of an operator which is acting at an infinite dimensional space. Uh, so none of this really actually makes sense. Um, but, um, you know, if we could actually take a limit of random of these, uh, these models of random triangulations, then we kind of interpret the limiting object as being a uh, kind of a rigorous way of defining this, right? Because our models of random triangulations are samples of discrete random surfaces uh, from where you take the uniform measure of these triangulations and you weight by the discrete Laplacian determinant. Right? So if you take a limit of kind of the, the natural discrete analog of this thing, you could interpret it as kind of an actual rigorous way of defining uh, this thing. So this is kind of the, the notion that the physicists were using and uh, you know, the triangulations are like a, uh, a rigorous or an attempt to make rigorous sense of, uh, of something of, uh, of this nature. All right. And uh, note that in this, uh, this one parameter family, the uniform, the case of uniform triangulations corresponds to central charge zero, uh, where we just have the, the zero power of the determinants. We're just sampling from the, uh, the uniform measure on possible Ramanian metric tensors. Uh, and in physics, that's sometimes referred to as uh, the case of pure random. Right? And it's kind of supposed to be the easiest case uh, with this, uh, out of this one parameter family of models. So uh, I want to say a little bit about kind of what is the physics interpretation of these things. So like why, uh, why was the physics community interested in these, uh, these random surfaces uh, you know, 40 years ago or so? Um, so uh, one, uh, one possible way of explaining what these things are physically is that they're supposed to be models of two-dimensional gravity coupled to some sort of matter, uh, where the matter is represented by a formal field theory with central charge C. Uh, and this, this determinant of the Laplace Beltrami operator is supposed to be like the, uh, the partition function of this informal field theory. Okay? So if you don't have a whole lot of background in physics, it probably doesn't make any more sense to you than the, the definition on the, uh, the previous slide. Um, but I can say maybe a little bit about a, maybe a more concrete uh, place uh, where these things were, were at some point expected to come up in the physics literature, uh, which was due to Polyakov uh, and kind of the, some of the very earliest papers uh, in physics studying these, uh, these random surfaces. Um, so Polyakov uh, was considering the case when this, uh, this parameter C is a, uh, a positive integer. Okay. Um, 
and uh, he was interested in, uh, in studying bosonic string theory. Uh, in bosonic string theory, uh, one can try to represent a string as a path in some Euclidean space, uh, which here will be R to the, uh, to the C, uh, which evolves in time. Okay? So I'm looking at strings in R to the C, which is why I need C to be a positive. Um, so you have a path uh, which evolves in time, and when you have a path which evolves in time, you have two parameters, right? There's the, the, the parameterization of the path itself, uh, and then there's the time parameter, which is governing how, uh, how things move as, uh, as time changes. Okay. Um, so we can kind of think of this path evolving in time as sweeping out some sort of surface uh, in, uh, in R to the C. Because right, you have a kind of a, uh, some sort of object in uh, in C-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, which is parameterized by two different parameters, right? The, uh, the, the parameterization of the path and the, and the time frame. Right? And Polyakov wanted to attempt to, to kind of study these, uh, these strings, i.e. These, these, uh, these paths evolving in time uh, by summing over all possible uh, surfaces that could be swept out by this string, all right? Um, he wanted to do something uh, that, was, that would be kind of analogous to the Feynman path integral, which is like a sum over all of the possible paths. Um, okay, and I guess if you want to uh, take a sum over all possible surfaces, you need to define a measure on the space of surfaces. Uh, and you want a measure not just on the space of surfaces, but a measure on surfaces together with uh, ways of drawing them in, uh, in C-dimensional space. Okay, we're here by an embedding and not requiring the sort of that it, it, that it be an embedding in the sense of differential geometry. It's just required to be like some kind of function from the surface into uh, to R to the C. Okay, and it's kind of a heuristic way of arguing that this determinant of the discrete of the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator on the surface, the power negative C over Q, can be thought of as counting in some sense the number of possible ways of embedding the surface into uh, R to the C. Um, and therefore, uh, one kind of naturally arises at the, uh, the uniform measure on surfaces uh, with this weighting. This can be thought of as a way, as like the uh, methodical measure that one can put on the set of all surfaces together with, uh, you know, that are kind of uh, weighted by the number of possible ways of embedding them in the hard uh, And if you could integrate with respect to this measure, then it could be interpreted as kind of summing over all of the possible trajectories of these, uh, of these strings. All right. So uh, that's kind of the, the heuristic interpretation that was put forward, forward by Polnikov. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me to what extent this, uh, this string theory interpretation is supposed to coincide uh, with reality. Uh, I'm not really up to date on which, which string theory models are believed to be, uh, be real and which ones are not. But at least this gives maybe some kind of visual, uh, you know, physical interpretation as to why one might want this, this measure around uh, on surfaces. Okay. But what, what leads to the number 25? So the, uh, the number 25 is related to the fact that uh, in some of the models of string theory, uh, string theory is supposed to be in 26 dimensional space. And so it's believed that if you take these things and you put a power which is bigger than 25 here, that it's just supposed to be degenerate. It's not supposed to be possible to make sense of this at the, at the surface at all. So, but can exactly 25 work? Um, so exactly 25 sort of works. So there are some things that you can say in the case of exactly 25 uh, by kind of taking a limit of stuff with C less than 25, um, but it's, it's kind of unclear exactly what happens. It is because I only know one theorem where the 25 is important. It's for compactness of constants for a curvature metric for a problem type. Mm -hmm. So it's only true of the dimension 25 and then it's false. Yes. For so I, I believe it's related to that and it's also for reasons which are somewhat mysterious to me. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, it's, uh, it turns out, so it's kind of, it's kind of believed uh, at a physics level, level of rigor, and it turns out to be uh, rigorously provable that this, uh, this family, this one parameter family of models splits into kind of two distinct phases. This is subcritical phase, which corresponds to values of C less than or equal to one, including all negative values of C. Um, and this phase is uh, kind of fairly well understood. Okay, so as I'll explain in just a moment, there's lots of things that we can construct rigorously in this phase. Uh, there's lots of things that we can prove. Uh, and uh, for things that we can't prove, uh, oftentimes there are concrete conjectures as to what the answers, uh, answers actually should be. 
And since they are reasonably, this, this phase is sort of reasonably well understood, but there's still, uh, still a number of open questions. Uh, and on the other hand, we have this supercritical phase when C is between 1 and 25. Uh, and in this case, stuff is much less well understood. Um, so things are, uh, things in this phase are, uh, are rather mysterious, uh, oftentimes even at a physics level of rigor. Um, and we're just kind of starting to understand what happens in this phase. Uh, but there are still some things that we can rigorously construct, uh, as I uh, have all this work. Uh, one interesting thing to note is that this poly interpretation, where you have strings in R to the C, uh, is really only interesting when C is a, uh, a positive integer, which is mostly just in this, uh, this supercritical case. The case where uh, you know, one has this, this, this interpretation in terms of uh, sums over evolving string, tra string trajectories uh, is kind of almost completely disjoint from the case in which uh, you know, things are actually fairly well understood. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I don't really know. I don't really have a good explanation as to why uh, why we would think that uh, you know, this space should be uh, should be uh, much larger than it turns out that indeed it is. <coughs> so that's a, a little bit of physics context, uh, and probably represents close to my close to the extent of my knowledge of the uh, the physics surrounding this theory. Um, and I now want to talk about something which. Uh, which I do have a, a, a much deeper understanding of, which is the, uh, the rigorous construction. of All right, so um, I want to explain to you now how we actually uh, rigorously construct global quantum gravity surfaces uh, for all values of the, uh, the parameter C between negative infinity and uh, infinity. All right, uh, and kind of the basic idea for doing this uh, is the following. So, uh, <laughs> uh, we want these new flat and gravity surfaces to be uh, represented by random Ramanian metric tensors on the sphere. Okay? We want to have some sort of a notion of a random geometry on the sphere represented by some sort of uh, some sort of random Ramanian metric tensor. All right. Now, if you have a, uh, a Ramanian metric tensor on the sphere, then you can always choose uh, local coordinates uh, in such a way that the uh, the metric tensor takes the form uh, G equals e to the f times the Euclidean metric tensor, or f is some function uh, on the, the domain by which you're parameterizing the surface. Uh, and this is just the, the standard uh, metric tensor for the Euclidean metric tensor. Uh, uh, this is called uh, kind of isothermal coordinates, and it's kind of a classical uh, theorem in uh, space temperature geometry. All right, so uh, maybe some of you don't know too much about Riemannian geometry, so let me explain. Uh, Exactly uh, how you can express various geometric things about the surface in terms of just this function f. Okay. So we have a set A contained in our domain, and the area of A uh, with respect to the, uh, the area measure on the surface is just given by the integral over A of e to the f with respect to the bay. Right? So areas have a very simple representation in terms of this function f. Uh, and likewise, uh, the length of a path. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the domain uh, with respect to the uh, kind of the, the geometry of the surface, which is given by the integral of e to the f over 2 along the path with respect to the uh, Euclidean length measure on the path. All right. So uh, areas and lengths uh, can be expressed in a simple way in terms of this function f. Um, and uh, furthermore, we can also express distances in function f. So in this case, the, uh, the expression is not quite as simple. Uh, but uh, the distance between two points C and W is just uh, the infimum of the length of the paths pointing to each other. All right, so we can express areas and length and distances just in terms of this function f. Um, and this is true for a, uh, a general deterministic uh, Ramanian vector tensor. And so if we want to choose a random Ramanian vector tensor, we just need to make a suitable random choice of this, uh, this function f. All right, and uh, it turns out that there's kind of a heuristic guess. Um, that f should uh, should be a uh, sort of standard Gaussian random function. All right. Um, so I'll say what I mean by that in just a moment. Uh, but let me say a little bit about maybe why one would think that it might be reasonable to have a, uh, a Gaussian random function coming out here. So, um, so we can think of a random planar map as being generated from a large amount of small small little bits of randomness. Which represent how the individual triangles are kind of glued, glued together uh, to produce this, uh, this triangle. Okay. 
Um, so maybe by some sort of rough analogy with the central limit theorem, we should think that if we have something which is generated by a large number of little bits, individual randomness, then maybe uh, maybe the limit should be something which has a, uh, a gap. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the there's a heuristic for this in the physics literature, which is a little bit different than the one that I just gave, uh, but it was maybe just as far from being an actual rigorous uh, rigorous statement. Uh, but it nevertheless turns out that this guess uh, appears to be correct. Um, and it can be proven to be correct in, uh, in, some, in some senses. Right, so let me now say uh, what I actually mean by a standard Gaussian random function. All right, so the, uh, the, the Gaussian random function that we're going to be looking at is what's called the, uh, the Gaussian free field. Right, so this is the, uh, the centered Gaussian process uh, parameterized by uh, some domain, uh, some open set U in the, in the, uh, in the plane R2. Uh, whose covariate structure is given as follows. So, we, uh, so for any, uh, any two points Z and W, the Gaussian free field H evaluated at Z, and the Gaussian free field H evaluated at W uh, have a joint normal distribution uh, with mean zero, uh, and the covariance between them is given by uh, the Green's function uh, on, the, on the domain U um, evaluated at Z and W. So this is the, the Green's function just for the, the Laplace operator on U with, uh, with zero bounds. All right, um, and uh, the particular definition of the Green's function is going to be so important for us. Uh, for this talk, all we really need to know is that uh, the Green's function uh, at Z and W is equal to the log of one over absolute value of Z minus W plus some smooth function uh, G depending on the domain. Uh, uh, now, there is, of course, a, uh, a, uh, a big problem with this definition, uh, which is that as Z, uh, as Z and W get closer together here, uh, the screen's function goes to infinity. Right? Because the green's function is equal to the log function plus something smooth. And the, uh, the log function goes to infinity. The log of one over absolute value v minus w, of course, goes to infinity uh, as z approaches w. Uh, and this guy remains bounded. And so the, uh, the covariance of h of z and h of w goes to infinity as, uh, as z approaches w. Okay. Um, so consequently, uh, the variance of the Gaussian free field at any point v. Uh, I mean, the covariance of h of z with h of z uh, is equal to infinity. Now, it's not entirely clear how one would define a uh, Gaussian random variable with infinite variance. Uh, as a consequence of that, it's not actually possible to find the Gaussian free field at a function. It's not actually makes sense of the Gaussian free field evaluated at a point. Uh, rather, uh, we can only make sense of it as a generalized function, uh, aka a distribution. So that means that uh, we, can't, we can't define the value at a point, but we can define for a sufficiently nice test function P on the domain U. Uh, we can define the integral of the Gaussian free field times P with respect to, uh, to a vague measure uh, on the domain U. Right? And that integral will be a centered Gaussian random variable with the variance given by a double integral of P against the screen's function on the over uh, over the cross. It's not actually a function, but it is a, uh, a generalized function. Okay, and to give you a sense as to what this thing looks like, on the left, I've shown here a, uh, a graph of a uh, kind of a line version of the Gaussian free field. The graph of kind of a, a, an actual continuous function, which approximates the, the Gaussian free field. And as you can see, uh, the graph is rather uh, spiky. It has this very uh, mountainous landscape here. Uh, and we can think that as the, uh, the function gets Closer and closer to actually approximating the Gaussian free field, these spikes get larger and larger, uh, and you end up with something which is uh, which is not a function at all. But that's the uh, the Gaussian free field, um, and I now want to give a more precise statement of the idea that the Louisville cotton gravity uh, metric tensor should be given by the, uh, the exponential of the Gaussian. Free field. Right. So to do that, I first want to introduce a uh, another parameter, uh, which I'll call gamma. Uh, and which is related to the central charge parameter C by C equals 25 minus six times gamma over two plus two over gamma squared. And so it's kind of an ugly formula, but uh, this, is, uh, this is the formula that we have. Um, and then a, uh, a more precise statement of this kind of textual representation of the, uh, the metric tensor uh, says that the, uh, the Romanian metric tensor for a, uh, a Louisville quantum gravity surface in local coordinates should take the form e to the gamma times the Gaussian free field times the, uh, the, the Euclidean metric tensor. All right, so we want to have a, uh, a Romanian, the, the Romanian metric tensor 
uh, on one of these uh, these random surfaces that we're sampling from the uniform measure on all surfaces weighted by the uh, velocity determinant uh, should be the same uh, as looking at this uh, this random Ramanian metric tensor where we just take the Gaussian free field, we take e to the gamma times the Gaussian free field, uh, and then we do like the, the isothermal coordinate representation. Okay, so we just have like uh, this, this representation of the Ramanian metric tensor uh, like we had a, a couple of slides ago, uh, but with f equal to a, uh, a multiple of the Gaussian free field uh, with multiple depends on, uh, on C. Okay. Is, is there a simple expression for the determinant of the Laplace unit in isothermal coordinates um, that would sort of maybe help in understanding this? Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not aware of one, but it's possible. That there's... Maybe the, something with the product of the eigenvalues or maybe the product of the Yeah, I mean, of course, you can always take Product yeah. yeah. No, no, I'm just trying to yeah, like figure what's device. going on here. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of mysterious, and there's not really a, an obvious. I, I don't think there's a really an obvious justification. And, and is there a distance? And uh, can you compute the distance between two points for that? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, and I'll explain that in, uh, in just a minute. And so, is the diameter finite? Yes, it is. Well, it's it's finite if c is less than. Less than equal to one. Okay. Um, right. So uh, again, this is an <coughs> sorry, sorry, you, but the area is infinity, but no. The area is, is finite as C is less than or equal to one, isn't it? And it's infinity as C is greater than one. But the, it wasn't the other dimension for? Uh, yeah, but you have a fractal area. So like you can if you can take the, the Minkowski context for the metric, but with a max element, which is not cheap. Uh -huh. And then you would get a finite. And then get fine. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. So this, this Ramani metric tensor still does not make literal sense. It involves an exponential of the Gaussian free field, which is a generalized function, not actually a function. Okay. Um, but it turns out that it's easier to make literal sense of this than it is to make literal sense of the uniform measure on all possible Ramani metric tensors. Okay, and basically the reason is. That we can, uh, we can just take this Gaussian free field and we can mollify it, and then we can try to take limits of objects associated with this, uh, this metric tensor. Okay, so let me now explain how to do that uh, and thereby define a measure and a metric associated with a fluid robotic gravity surface. Um, okay, but uh, first, let me make uh, a note. Uh, so, this, this representation really only makes sense in the, uh, in the, the sum critical case when C is less than or equal to one. Because if you take this, uh, this formula relating gamma and C, then when C is between 1 and 25, uh, the only solutions for gamma are, uh, are complex. Uh, so you then kind of end up with a complex valued Ramani metric tensor. And it's not entirely clear how you could find this stuff for, uh, for that. Okay, so that's maybe one reason why this, uh, this C between 1 and 25 case is, uh, is more mysterious. Okay, but we can still define some things for it uh, as. As, as we'll see. All right, so let me now explain how to find the, uh, the area measure associated with this, uh, at least for C less than or equal to one, uh, which corresponds to the case when gamma is actually uh, three. All right, so I uh, want to define the, uh, the area measure, which should be uh, kind of in isothermal coordinates. It should be the measure, which is just given by integrating e to the gamma times the Gaussian free field uh, against Lebesgue. This doesn't make literal sense because the Gaussian free field is not a function. Uh, so its exponential is not, uh, not well defined. Um, but we can still uh, define it uh, via mollification in the following way. So let's let <coughs> uh, for epsilon greater than zero be a family of continuous functions which approximate the Gaussian free field uh, in some sense as, uh, as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, for example, we could just take a smooth mollifier. So, like, you know, uh, a bump function which is has total mass one is, and is supported in a small uh, small Euclidean ball, and we just convolve the Gaussian free field with that and define that to be uh, that to be h epsilon. Uh, and we're going to kind of parameterize these h epsilons in such a way that the variance of h epsilon of z grows like log one over epsilon as uh, as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, this variance is going to have to be going to infinity, um, kind of from the fact that the, uh, the Gaussian free field uh, in some sense has infinite variance at every point. Um, and so we can just choose the parameter epsilon in such a way that this variance grows like uh, grows like a log. 
All right. Um, so we can now, uh, now that we have these H epsilons, we define a random measure, which is just given by integrating into the gamma H epsilon times omega. Okay. Uh, that's perfectly well defined since H epsilon is actually a function. Uh, and it turns out that if we multiply this by this regularizing factor, epsilon to the gamma squared root two, uh, and send epsilon to zero, uh, then these, uh, these random measures, uh, depending on H epsilon, will converge to a limit as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. And this limiting measure, uh, we can kind of interpret as like the, uh, the volume form associated with our, uh, our random, uh, random, random volume. Um, so this, uh, this measure that we get in the limit is not absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, rather, it is emotionally mutually singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, but emotionally, it has finite total mass, assigns positive mass to every open set, and assigns zero mass to every point. Okay. Uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of what this looks like, I've shown in the bottom here some simulations of this, uh, this measure for different values of the, the parameter gamma. Okay. This first one, so the, basically the, the different colors in these pictures indicate kind of how, how concentrated the measure is in uh, different places. Okay, so like uh, kind of like the light blue is the highest concentration, and the darker blue is less concentration, and then gray corresponds to kind of a, a lower, lower density of the measure. All right, um, so as you can see when gamma is, is smaller, which corresponds to like a kind of a more negative value of C, uh, the measure is somewhat more evenly spread out uh, over the uh, over the domain, um, and in fact, as gamma goes to zero or c goes to negative infinity, these measures just converge to limit. Okay, so they're kind of less rough when uh, when gamma is very small, uh, and as gamma gets larger, the mass becomes uh, less less evenly spread out uh, over the uh, over the domain. All right, so we can think of gamma as kind of controlling how how rough this uh, this measure is. All right, so we have a random measure associated with this, uh, this usual quantum gravity surface. Uh, and uh, this, to kind of make the connection back to random triangulations, this measure is expected to describe the limit of the appropriately renormalized counting measure on the vertices of random triangulations. Uh, uh, and, uh, but at this point, this has been proven only in the special case when uh, C is zero, uh, which by the, the formula relating C and gamma corresponds to gamma equals so only in the case of uh, uniform triangulations, which correspond to this one special value of gamma, uh, are we able to actually prove this conjecture that this uh, this measure describes the limit of, uh, of counting measure and vertices of uh, of random triangulations. All right. Um, then in a, uh, a similar vein, uh, one can also define the uh, the Ramanian distance function associated with this Ramanian metric function. Okay. So it's the same same kind of regularization procedure. I uh, replace the Gauss, actual Gaussian free field H by this mollified version H epsilon, define the Ramanian distance function for H epsilon, and then we take a limit as epsilon goes to zero. All right. Um, and this gives us a random metric uh, on the sphere, um, which can be interpreted as the Ramanian distance function associated with a legal quantum gravity surface. And in this limiting, you also multiply by epsilon to some power? Uh, yes, you do. Um, so in this case, uh, yes, it's a different power. Yeah, but you still have that, you still have that kind of uh, that kind of normalization. Uh, so the, the kind of the idea of the approximation procedure is similar, but actually proving convergence is much harder than in the case of the measure, because uh, to define the approximations, you have to take a, uh, a minimum over all possible paths. And the minimizing path depends on epsilon. So you have to kind of control how the minimizing path varies as uh, as this parameter, uh, this parameter epsilon and the regularization. Right, so this makes it a lot harder to show convergence uh, in the case of the metrics and in the case of the measure, uh, but it can still be done. So we can define Louisville quantum gravity surfaces as, uh, as random metric measure spaces uh, for all values of C in the, uh, the subcritical space. Okay. Um, and uh, the, uh, the metric that we get associated with this Louisville quantum gravity surface induces the same topology as the Euclidean metric. This Louisville quantum gravity surface viewed as a metric space is still homeomorphic to the sphere, uh, but its geometry is very different. Um, for example, uh, the Hausdorff dimension is always strictly larger than two, uh, and it depends on the uh, the parameter gamma. Uh, uh, as I said before, uh, when gamma is when uh, central charge is zero or gamma equals the square root of eight thirds, we know that the Hausdorff dimension is four, 
um, because in that case, the, the Hausdorff dimension of this Brownian map, which describes the limit of uniform triangulations, is, uh, is four. Uh, but for general values of gamma, we don't actually know what this Hausdorff dimension is. But, and computing it is one of the big open problems in this, uh, in this subject. All right. And uh, just like the measure is supposed to describe, in some sense, the, the limit of counting measure on vertices of random triangulations, uh, this metric is supposed to describe the limit of the appropriately rescaled graph dependence on random triangulations. Uh, but also, just as in the case of the measure, it has only been proven in a special case when uh, central charge is zero or gamma is uh, gamma is four to one. Right. So we have this, uh, this one parameter family of random metric measure spaces that are supposed to describe the limits of random triangulations. Um, but it's only been proven uh, in uh, one special case. So we in SQL zero, what is the area? In that uh, territory, that's uh, what, what is the area of that sphere? Uh, so it's, it's uh, it has unit area and the diameter. The diameter is random, but it's finite. Some some random finite number. It has and it has unit area just because we're fixing the total number of triangles in the, in the triangulation. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to give you uh, kind of a quick sense as to what this, uh, this metric looks like. So I've shown here a computer simulation of one of these usual topographic metric blocks. So here the colors indicate the distance to the center point, uh, which is this, this black dot here. Uh, and the black curves are geodesics, so length minimizing paths going from the center point to other points in the block. So a couple of features to point out. One is that the boundary of this thing is, uh, is clearly fractal. It's not look at all like a smooth curve. Um, and in fact, what it shows the Hausdorff dimension of this boundary with respect to the Euclidean metric is strictly bigger than one. Okay, so it is indeed a fractal object. Um, and these geodesics uh, have kind of an interesting tree like structure. So if you look at two geodesics started at different points, uh, going back to the, the center point, then in fact, they will, uh, at, some, at some, uh, some finite time, they will merge together and then stay together uh, for a non trivial interval of time. Before getting back to the starting point. Uh, so, this property is called confluence of geodesics, uh, and it's true for uh, various types of fractal random metrics, and it's not true for like a smooth Ramanian metric. Uh, so, the geodesics behave in a very different way than they would for a, uh, for a smooth, uh, smooth Ramanian metric. Uh, uh, now, here's a, a simulation of this, uh, this same thing for a, a larger volume of gamma. As you can see, uh, the boundary gets kind of rougher. And here you can really see that there are some holes uh, which, it, uh, which the ball just connects to infinity. So the, uh, the metric ball is not a, uh, not a simply connected region. Um, and then when gamma gets bigger, it just these, these effects become more pronounced. So the boundary gets rougher and there gets to be more holes. Uh, and, uh, and so forth. All right, so everything that I've said so far about this rigorous construction of usual quantum gravity as a metric microspace has been only in the subcritical. Um, and then I want to say a little bit about the supercritical case, uh, which is between 1 and 25, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll end the talk. So it turns out that we can also construct the, uh, the metric associated with usual quantum gravity uh, in this supercritical case. So we can define uh, usual quantum gravity surfaces as random metric, random metric spaces uh, when C is between 1 and 25. But we cannot define the measure in this case. Uh, one can maybe think of the measure as just being identically equal to infinity. Um, when uh, when C is between one and twenty-five, okay. uh, in this case, the uh, the geometry of the uh, this random metric is uh, is much much weirder than it is in the subcritical case. Okay, so already in the subcritical case, we had sort of a fractal geometry, but we still had the Euclidean topology. In the supercritical case, the uh, the metric no longer induces the Euclidean topology on the sphere. Uh, rather, there if you take your metric and you parameterize it by the sphere. Then there is an uncountable, dense, zero Lebesgue measure set of points, uh, which have infinite distance to every other point. Uh, so one way of thinking about this visually is we can think about like these kind of visual representations of the metric space, like I showed before uh, in the subcritical case. Uh, what would happen to be a similar picture in the supercritical case, except that these spikes actually go all the way off to infinity. So we actually have uh, have some places where things just blow up all the way to. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the distance between two typical points is still uh, still finite uh, because the set of these bad, these infinite spikes has uh, has zero limit measure uh, when it's uh, when it's parameterized by the sphere. Right. 
So as a consequence of this, uh, the metric balls in the supercritical case uh, have positive Lebesgue measure. Those typical points are at finite distance from each other, uh, but they have empty Euclidean interior. So very weird looking sets, and this is a simulation of one of these sets in the supercritical case. Okay. So here you can see that kind of there's holes all over the place, which corresponds to the fact that it has that empty uh, empty uh, and furthermore, the, the Hausdorff dimension of this metric space in the supercritical case is, uh, is infinity. Instead of being some finite number, which is bigger than two, it's actually just a uh, All right, so we have a very, uh, very bizarre geometry for these things uh, in the case when uh, central charge is in one of the Okay, so uh, this last slide just contains kind of a summary of the things that I've discussed. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll end the talk. And, and the talk here and uh, you know open up for, for questions. <laughs>